John Barnett here, and welcome to another week of our 52 Greatest Chapters of the Bible study. As you can see on the screen, we've gotten to uh, week 47, and uh, my wonderful wife, Bonnie, uh, who is doing all the recording, uh, together with me, audio and the cameras, is right here, and she's praying because she's watched me spend extra time this week. It's three chapters, and I can't believe we're going to get to cover this together. Uh, if you're just here for the very first time, you're in the middle of a uh, 52 greatest chapters of the Bible study, and uh, I'm on the road. Uh, my name is John Barnett, my wonderful wife, Bonnie. We're full-time missionaries. Uh, we're actually finishing up our first quarter. Uh, we've been um, over 13 weeks traveling. Uh, we've been teaching in, in multiple countries. We've done live audience uh, classrooms in Bible institutes and Bible colleges. Uh, we've also done things like this, uh, remote learning for groups. Uh, I'm so excited. I'll, I'll try and work in some of, the, some of the incredible things God has let us see that he's doing. Uh, but while we're here today, uh, you're looking at week 47 of a 52-week-long study. And if this is your first time, I'd encourage you to go back to week zero, listen to the how-to video, how to study the Bible, uh, my resources. I have my uh, Logos library on my phone. I always carry my paper Bible with me, and you can see there I've been really marking up uh, the book of 1 Peter. And of course, constantly taking notes. And uh, let me look for... This, uh, well, this is what I did this morning. Let me back up because I'm actually in uh, Romans and the Gospels, but let me back up to uh, uh, what I'm doing with you. I've already started working on Paul's life and letters, and I'm very excited about that study too, but we're finishing our year together with all of you that are in the 52 Greatest Chapter study. But what we do is we write the chapter title and the summary. We find all the lessons that we can find uh, personal. Uh, these are uh, truths and principles that, that God touches my heart with from his word. And then I write down here a prayer. And all of this that's in my journal is going to be typed out and you'll be able to see it. But let's get right into it. Uh, the book of 1 Peter, and especially these three chapters we're looking at, is what you see on the screen. Peter is teaching the early saints how to be preparing to reflect Christ. Now look at this, in a darkening, hostile culture. So they were in the Roman world. It was darkening, sin, evil, wickedness, uh, false teaching, everything. And Christianity was facing persecution. Now this is the classic uh, picture of Peter, remember, holding the keys. Uh, he introduced the gospel to the Jews on Pentecost. He introduced it to the Samaritans in the revive, or the evangelism of Philip, and then to Cornelius, the Gentiles. And so those three groups, Peter used those keys. But uh, let's start in the slides. Uh, right here is where we are in week 47. We're covering three chapters, just like we did last week. And James was an incredible time. But this builds on what we saw last week. And, uh, and the, the kind of setting that, that uh, all of you that are with us normally know, but if you're just with us, I am prayerfully sitting here on this side of the table with my Bible and my notebook, but I'm looking at my iPhone, which is the camera Bonnie uses with our, our Switcher Studio. Uh, I'm looking at that iPhone like it's you, like you're sitting across the table, like we're at Panera or Chipotle or... Uh, you know, Starbucks, which is uh, the main places that for years I ran Bible studies, uh, small group Bible studies. But this is what we're doing. We're looking at suffering and, and why God allows suffering and the purpose. Sanctification, that's what God does with the suffering in our lives, using his word by his spirit. And then we get a great look in chapter three at marriage. And so this is just a, a, a great study. Now, the 52 greatest chapters is the, the name of this 52-week year-long study. We're surveying the whole Bible by just using these representative chapters. Now, I personally have read the Bible over 100 times, and each time I've read it, I've taken notes. And once, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 
about eight years ago, I started a small group when I was pastoring a local church in Michigan, and I said, would you mind sitting with me, letting me introduce what I'm studying in the Bible to you once a week, and then you study through that with me, and we'll come back and share what we find in the journal. And it was the most, personally, the most growth-filled time for me in my life, and for those that were in the group. I mean, it, it literally changed their lives. For example, um, I'll never forget walking around the, the Calvary Bible Church, and I would be in the wide hallways between services, and I would run into people that I'd never met, and that was normal, but this would be wives of men in my group. And they would come to me and they'd say, what are you telling my husbands on Monday mornings at 6 a.m. or Tuesday mornings at 6.30 or Wednesday morning at 7 or whenever the group was meeting? I say, well, why do you ask? They say, well, are you telling him to do things uh, in our home or with me? And I said, like what? They said, well, all kinds of things are happening. Uh, he watches television less. He's, he's less occupied with his with his hobbies, he's spending more time with the children, he's talking to me, in fact, it, it's more than I've ever been used to, plus he's asking me if it's okay if he, if he reads the Bible with me, if he shares with me what God's teaching him, and he even prays with me every day. And, and that, that little kind of uh, clip was played over and over by, by the maybe 30 different uh, family members, wives, uh, girlfriends of the guys that were in my Bible studies. Um, God was at work. And I pray God be at work in your life. He's at work in my life today using this, the devotional method. Now, what's the devotional method? You title every chapter of the Bible. Now, you can go to our website, discoverthebook.org, discoverthebook.org. That's our main website. And that website has for you resources. Now one of them is the whole 52 Greatest Chapter Devotional Method Study Guide. So you can download it. It tells what the 52 chapters are and it gives a, a much wider, uh, longer, elongated description of this uh, method. You look for lessons. You find as many lessons, truths, and doctrines. You, you invest extra time using, and I strongly recommend the MacArthur Study Bible. You can read about it down in the description of this video. Find a link, look it over on Amazon. Uh, I would encourage you to have one. I have not only my big four pound leather one that I keep in my study, but I also have an electronic version here, as well as Grudem and all the other resources I mentioned I carry with me. Uh, Bonnie and I are full-time missionaries. We've taught the Bible in f almost 60 different countries around the world. And we, we spend uh, three-fourths or more of our time traveling between Bible training centers. So that's us. But here's what the devotional method is. You find these lessons, now look at this, and you write a prayer in which you ask the Lord to unleash those truths into your life. I'm going to show you how to do this. So in my journal, I started by doing a, a study on Peter. So here's a picture of Peter, Peter from the uh, classic artist, you know, being crucified, Peter, you've already seen holding those keys. Uh, he was a fisherman. He was one of the first disciples. You can read about that. In fact, we study that in our other 52-week 52 52 course, which is going through the Gospels using the Holy Land as a backdrop. Uh, it's called the Land of the Book Video Study Tour. And you can read about that also down in the description of this video. And that's an incredible journey uh, that we've taken. Uh, so far, we've taken 2,500 people physically to the land of the book, and we've taken, uh, getting close to that number, virtually to the land of the book. And they actually go to the Holy Land, and they see the spot right here where Peter was called. He left everything, it says in Luke, to follow Christ. Uh, he was also called Cephas. Uh, and of course, Petros, Petra, that comes in the rock and the stone in Matthew 16. Uh, Jesus said that uh, on this rock, his confession of Jesus as the Christ, he would build the church. Uh, remember, Peter denied Christ. Jesus restored Peter. Uh, after Pentecost, Peter was the, the first one to publicly proclaim the resurrected Christ. And then, of course, um, the largest church in the world is built on top of Nero's circus, uh, chariot racing track in Rome, 
where an obelisk stood in the center, which is still uh, gracing the spot of St. Peter's Cathedral. And that's most likely the spot where Peter was crucified upside down in somewhere between 64 and 68 AD. And by the way, that, that is our newest course, the course I'm teaching right now. Uh, we already started it uh, a few months ago uh, in Greece and in Italy, and we're going back to the United Kingdom and back to Greece and uh, to Italy, teaching the life and letters of Paul. It's, it's taking uh, the book of Acts as the backdrop and interleaving every one of Paul's 13 epistles, where they fit in the record of the early church in the book of Acts. And so we actually go uh, as a part of that course right there to where Peter was uh, martyred for Christ. Uh, when you read the book of Acts, which is how we learn, the Gospels introduce us to Peter, and then the book of Acts kind of enlarges it. Look what Peter does. He gives that first Gospel message in Acts 2. Uh, then he, he starts ministering uh, to the early church meeting in Solomon's colonnade. And then uh, he speaks before the Sanhedrin. Um, the apostles speak. Peter again preaches at Cornelius' house. Then look, in chapter 12, right here, the whole focus of Acts changes. And it goes from 12 chapters of Peter kind of being the center stage. He moves off, and I'll show you in a minute where he goes and what he does. And Paul comes to the forefront. And of course, Paul starts preaching on his first missionary journey there in Antioch, then in Lystra, then in Athens, and on we go through the New Testament book of Acts. Now, let's look at 1 Peter 1, 1 through 8. Now, in our study, and some of you, you've got to remember these basic uh, kind of like techniques that we use to maximize. You, you get your journal out, you're always doodling, jotting, putting any thoughts down that you have, but also mark in your Bibles. And I don't have, uh, usually I have another camera, and we had to travel light for this extended journey. But my other camera looks down, and you can see my Bible. So what I'll do is I'll just describe to you what I would have shown you and pointed with my stylus here. But, but in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. So notice what I said right here. Peter was the most well-known apostle in the Gospels. Uh, and, and then I real quickly did some background work. And I used the MacArthur Study Bible and, and all my concordance and everything else in my study tools and found out uh, right here that no one ever claimed greater loyalty than Peter. I mean, he just said, everyone else will fail you, I won't, you know. Uh, no one was ever honored like Peter. Jesus didn't tell any of the other di uh, disciples that, that you're Peter and the confession you just made is the foundation of the church. He was honored. Uh, no one else was honored like him. And no one was ever rebuked as sharply. Remember, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, looking right at Peter. I mean, what a rebuke. No one ever denied Jesus like Peter. Not once, not twice, but three times. You can read about that there in Matthew. No one was ever more totally smitten by his or her sin in the sight of Jesus like Peter was. It says he grieved deeply and, and repented. Um, no one ever grieved more completely, and no one ever knew Jesus better or loved him more, for that matter, wanted his approval more than Peter, and no one was ever restored more tenderly than Peter. When we're in the Holy Land in the uh, video study tour, we actually do an entire hour lesson right there on the seashore uh, it's called the, the uh, Church of the Primacy today in Israel, but it's, it's a church built, and we don't go in the church, we go to the shore of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus restored Peter. Remember the, the little fire in the dark, and they were out fishing, and, and John says, hey, Peter, it looks like Jesus, and you remember Jesus tells them to cast their net on the other side. You remember that whole story? Well, we, we actually teach the whole 21st chapter. See right here, John 21. Uh, we teach that whole chapter right on the spot. So in your Bible, what, what I've written down is that this, and you can see it a little bit behind me there, um, how to reflect Christ in a darkening, hostile world of suffering. That's really what we're introduced to in chapter one. Now we're not covering chapter one. Uh, we're only doing two, three, and four. And you say, Everyone always asks me, if we were at Panera, you'd say, 
how come? Why don't we do all of them? Why don't we do five? That's so good. I say, I know. But see, that as soon as we start doing that, we have to cover all 1,189 chapters. I'm trying to survey the Bible, but I started out doing chapter four about darkening, hostile world of suffering. That's chapter four is all about that. But I always would say, well, look at chapter two, because that talks about how you grow spiritually as newborn babes. And then chapter three, it'll, if you're ever going to be married or if you are married or hope to be, this is the chapter for you. So when we have all three of those, I usually would cover them by the way, you know, as an aside. But now I'm going to focus on two, three, and four. But to introduce Peter, look at verse one of chapter one, 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 Peter, an apostle of Jesus. So I, you know, circled that word apostle. Then look at who he's writing to, still in verse 1. To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's his target. And in just a minute, I'm going to show you why that's his target, where that was, and why that makes this book amazing, okay? So those are some things you should have marked and noted in your Bible as you read it. And, and I would read through every day this week... Uh, well, what I would do is I'd read the whole book of 1 Peter, but you only are supposed to read chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. But it's such a blessing. Take the extra time and read all five chapters. And uh, I actually did all five in my journal, but I'm not going to show them to you because it's not part of our focus, but it's a blessing, okay? So the life of Peter has three parts. Each era of his life speaks of how he served the Lord. Number one, in the Gospel by Mark, we have Peter walking with Jesus. Did you know that? Mark came to Peter as Peter was, was so hunted by the Roman Empire, and Mark recorded Peter's eyewitness account of walking three and a half years with Jesus. So that's what the gospel by Mark is. It's not Mark's gospel. It's the gospel by Mark recording the words of Peter and the eyewitness account of Peter. Number two. In the book of Acts, as I just told you, verse, or chapter 1 through 12, we have Peter working for Jesus. So he's walking with Jesus, working for Jesus. Then from Acts 12 onward, the epistles of Peter, we have Peter waiting for Jesus. He was always talking about him, living in a tent. And the time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready to go. And, and that's, that's what we learn. He was waiting for Jesus. Now, let's go through the book of Acts. Uh, remember, the ministry of Peter, as you see here, is the first 12 chapters. It's kind of the, 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 what overshadows everything else is the life of Peter. Here are the key events, Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You can read all those. In fact, this is personally what I do every time I read. I'm just, I'm writing down because when you write down, you see and you're, you're you know, writing and so there are all those, uh, parts of your brain that, that your handwriting affects. And then you're, you're sharing this as a group. So you're hearing it and you're speaking it. And by using so many senses, it deepens it. So that's why I make this chart. Just for you to know, here's the Roman emperor that's uh, in Acts chapter 1. It's Tiberius and Tiberius and Tiberius. You see all the way across. Uh, the Roman governors, uh, notice that that is Pilate all the way across because he's 26 to 36. Here's the date. And, and by the way, you get all this from the MacArthur Study Bible. So, so that's just a little tool for you to use. But now look what happens. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter's at Joppa and Paul is in Tarsus, we have a new prefect and we get a new emperor. Wow. And it's still the first 12 chapters are all about uh, Peter kind of in the spotlight. Uh, here is a juncture. Herod Agrippa dies. Before he dies, he imprisons Peter. He's going to kill him, actually. He already killed James, uh, the first apostle to die. Now he's trying to get the second apostle to be martyred. And so it's a juncture where persecution sends people all over the place. And that's part of the group that Peter is writing to, to those of the dispersion. Now, now look, James, before Peter writes, also... What Peter did is he went out and started ministering to all them all over uh, the outside of Israel. But James becomes the chapter or the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem, and we covered that last week, uh, and and writes his first epistle of the New Testament. 
Now, Paul becomes central from here through the end of the book. And, uh, but one more thing I want you to see. The Gospel by Mark is probably written somewhere around Acts 17, when Peter is traveling and probably being hunted in the 50s. Uh, at least he's being, uh, you know, uh, persecuted. And so just some of the events, and uh, James was written here last week's uh, Paul's epistles are starting to be uh, penned, but right here is Peter again. Now, this is the Roman Empire. Now, this is the map we use uh, when we're studying both the video study tour of the Gospels and are primarily focused right here on the Holy Land, or this is what we use in the Life and Letters of Paul. Uh, right here is Tarsus and Antioch, where Paul was from. Uh, the seven churches were here. Paul's missionary journeys are right through this area and like this and back. So basically, this is the world. Then Paul finally uh, sails and is shipwrecked on Malta, comes back in to finally get to Rome right there. Now, after Paul's first Roman imprisonment, he wanted to go to Spain. Church historians tell us he might have even made it up here to Britain, and he might have either sailed or gone overland. So Paul, his life's amazing. And this is the map we use both in the video study tour of the Gospels as well as in the life and letters of Paul. But I want you to see Peter's main focus is this area right here. Now let me show you another map of that. Uh, this is the epicenter of the empire. Now I'll back up. Uh, Rome is here, but yet they're in this province, Roman Asia, which we would call Turkey, this big purple blob there, was the most Roman part of the world. There are more Roman buildings in Turkey. There are more Greek, see here's Greece right there. There are more Greek temples in Turkey, more Roman buildings. And by the way, there are more Holy Land sites in in Turkey than even the, there are in Israel. I mean, it was the epicenter of the ancient world. But look at this. Do you remember what it says in 1 Peter 1, uh, verse 1a or b? To the pilgrims of the dispersion, remember that they were sent out by that persecution starting in Acts 12 and continuing on, uh, scattered throughout Pontus, that's up here, uh, Galatia, right here, and extending all the way down to here. Uh, Cappadocia, see it right there? Asia, Roman province of Asia, and Bithynia. So Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. This is where Peter was focusing. This was the most Roman part of the Roman Empire. This was also the epicenter of what God was doing around the world. This is where the, see the seven churches that John writes to, that Jesus visits? All of those things are right here in this area. That, in fact, this area where Peter writes got more letters than any other part of the world. There are 14 epistles of the New Testament uh, written to this area. Amazing to think about. Roman Asia was where the near extinction of Christianity uh, began to unfurl. You remember uh, Nero started it all. He was sporadic. Domitian kind of got it more um, systematized and Diocletian tried to and, and almost succeeded in extinguishing Christianity. Uh, what Diocletian did was three things. He got rid of every church building. He got rid of every complete copy of the scripture and he got rid of every leader of the church. Three things. And when you get the leaders and the, the scriptures and you destroy the meeting places, you are really dealing a blow to the church. And Satan knew that and he used Diocletian. And, and by the way, in our uh, uh, Revelation study, you can see an entire lesson on the near extinction of Christianity. I explained that. But why I'm bringing it up is, see, see what I wrote? Reflecting Christ in a darkening, hostile world of suffering. That's where we're headed. Look at this slide. Hard times are on the horizon for us in Christ church. And I'm looking forward to uh, next week, Lord willing, is 2 Peter. And when we get to 2 Peter, I'm going to answer the question all of you are asking. If you've been watching the news lately during the Ukrainian war, what is going on? 
Russia keeps threatening the United States and Great Britain and basically Europe and saying our Sarmat missiles, by the way, Sarmat, let me go back here. Um, let me see Sarmatia. Oh, there it is right there. See that? Sarmatia is in Russia. The Sarmat missiles are those missiles, if you remember, that one of them carries like 12 warheads and those 12 warheads each one of them is 100 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. And what they're saying on the news is that Russia is threatening to destroy the East Coast and West Coast of the United States when only take four missiles, two and two. Next week, as a part of our Second Peter 3, which talks about the end of the world, that's what Second Peter is all about. The, it's the ultimate description of what happens between Revelation 20 and Revelation 21 which is the end of the physical world and the complete recreate, the uncreation of the old world and the recreation and to newness of heaven. But what happens in between those two is described for us in 2 Peter 3. And I'm going to talk about what might happen to America. So study this, but next week we're going to have an interesting time. Basically, I'm going to tell you that I personally believe as a pastor, as a Bible teacher, as a Bible scholar, as a servant of the Lord, that hard times are coming for the United States of America. We should get ready for dark times, hostile times, and persecutions, okay? Um, here, here's just a quick timeline. Nero, uh, who executed Peter and Paul uh, before he died in 68. Domitian, who exiled John. And then here are all of the following emperors that were Christian killers. And here is the worst one, Diocletian. And we cover all that. So let's go to my Bible, and I'm going to start uh, showing you what I copied out of my Bible. I don't have the camera there, but I'm going to show you uh, on printed text and also the, the lessons and principles, and we'll go through those prayers. Uh, the book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome. Sometime after that, Luke is written, Paul's released from prison, fire in Rome, and Peter and Paul are martyred, and then, of course, the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, and then somewhere right in here is where we find John on Patmos, and Jesus comes back to visit, and all of those things. So that's, that's basically um, what we're going to see, this context of Peter is after uh, Paul's journey to Rome when he's writing this. Now, here's my summary. Uh, whoop, it's only to chapter 4 right there. Um, how to endure dangerous times of hostility and persecution. That's, that's the focus of, of the whole book of 1 Peter because they were facing it back then, just like we're facing it now. The world that Peter served the Lord in was a terrible time in history. Some of the most memorable pages in the history of the church are from the years 60 to 70. For half those years, the hatred and evils of Nero led to, and this is the key with Nero, random acts of fierce persecution. Under Nero... Across the city of Rome, believers were killed from the arena to the prisons. For his evening dinner guests, Nero would have the followers of Jesus dipped in tar, burned alive on sticks as torches in his imperial gardens. For the bloodthirsty masses at the games, Christians were wrapped in animal skins, chased to death by wild beasts. So, I mean, it's horrible to even say and think about. But that's what they went through and hard times for us are coming. The Bible promises it. Remember, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, okay? Next paragraph. Have you pondered how hard it must have been to be a Christian in those 10 years? Something to think about. Yet in that dangerous time to even be a believer, Peter wrote, boldly wrote to the Roman world saints about hoping to the end in Jesus. And as he did so, Peter had become the most wanted man of his day. Peter demonstrated holy boldness by surfacing to write these two epistles. It's just such a testimony. Okay, now, chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 1, okay? And so, around the table, now some of you are leading studies, and, and uh, in fact, Bonnie and I just were texted, uh, one of our dear friends who we knew in Michigan has moved down south, and they saw in our itinerary, we were teaching at a Bible institute near them, and they, they texted and said, could you please stop for just an hour? We're doing your small group study, and we want everybody in our house to meet you. And there they were, uh, I don't know, 14 or 15 of them. 
and they had their Bibles, they had their notebooks, they watch the video, they discuss it, they, they do the study themselves. Wow, this is what I did for them, I'm going to do for you. I said, take your Bible, look at verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. Therefore, look what I wrote. Spiritual growth is a choice. Now, my title right here for chapter 2 is How God Grows Me. Now, I do a different title every day that I study a chapter. I, I change it a little bit, but the one I want you to remember is How God Grows Me. And then this is another one of my titles. God lays down the pathway for spiritual growth for believers. We should be like, look at verse 2, as a newborn baby. Now, as a father of eight wonderful children and, and Bonnie, the, the incredible mom and, and uh, teacher and, and nurturer of all those children, I love you, honey. Uh, but after seeing those eight children grow, one thing I'll always remember is how much they wanted to be fed in those early days as newborns. They would just scream and yell and turn red and their mouths would be wide open. They'd just be, I mean, like in a rabid state until they got fed. And then they just totally relaxed. And see what it says, as newborn babes desire like a baby to be fed. Pause. If you were at Panera, I would lean across the table with my Bible and say, is that? Is that how you would describe your hunger for the Bible? That you're like a newborn baby that can't wait for the bottle or to be nursed by mom? And as soon as you're connected, you just relax? That's the only way to survive what's coming. That's why this is, that's why before we get to chapter four with the fiery trials, we have to look first at this truth. Spiritual growth is a choice. It demands hard choices. It's based on the work of the gospel, the therefore. Spiritual growth is based on and only possible for those who are genuinely saved by redemption. That's in chapter 1. They have purified their souls. That's verse 122. And have been born again. So see, everything is based on that chapter 1. So that's why you can read it this week. Okay, secondly, forsaking sin is a battle. See what it says? Lay aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all evil speaking. Wow. Forsaking sin is a battle. Thirdly, hunger for the word shows spiritual health. I must want to eat my meal. Did you know there's either healthy Christians or sick Christians? And the way you can tell the difference is healthy Christians are hungry for the word. And they are more hungry for the word than they are for the latest updates from the stock market or from Twitter or from Facebook or from TikTok or from whatever your online social media attachment is, they want to be attached to God. Do you? Anything that takes God's place, anything that pushes the Bible out of the way is an idol. And that's what we have to each think about. What, what idols need to be laid aside? I need the word to grow. And growth only comes via God's word. Okay, my fifth lesson, look in verse 3. It says, uh, if indeed you've tasted the Lord is gracious. Wow, tasting the Lord, his grace is so satisfying. I can taste God's grace that draws me back for more. Is that, is that your testimony? Of his fullness have we received grace upon grace. Do you hunger and thirst after Christ and his righteousness? Do you, like David said, I, wanna, I want to you know, come into your courts. Like Paul said, I want to know you. Like Peter said, be like a newborn baby. I hope, I pray. In fact, my prayer for you is that this week, of all the weeks of the 52, this week, that you'll say, God, I want to hunger for you like a newborn baby. And you start feeling that satisfying grace. Number six, God has great plans for our life. Now, um, see this right here? That means MacArthur Study Bible. I clipped out some of the words from the MacArthur Study Bible. Let me read them to you. First, I wrote, each of us are part of the church, yet we're unique. We're all built together to offer spiritual worship. Old Testament priests and New Testament believers share nine characteristics. That's in the MacArthur Study Bible. You should look at that. It's a fascinating study. The main privilege of priests, however, is access to God. Offering up spiritual sacrifices. Those are God-honoring works that are done because Christ 
uh, under the direction of the Holy Spirit and guidance of the Word of God, I want to do these. What are they? One, offering the strength of my body. That's what Romans 12. Praising God. That's what Hebrews 13 says. Doing good, Hebrews says. Sharing my resources. By the way, I will pause to say that the only way Bonnie and I travel and teach, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of next generation students is because of you. I never dreamed that, that those of you that became our church family uh, that, that we meet with across the table like this would, would actually support us to the level that you are. Uh, you have made it possible for remote studios. In fact, you can't see it here, but behind me, all the gear that we need, the, the lights and all these tripods and this desk and these uh, different devices we're using, all of that those of you that are part of our team have provided. The, the flights, uh, we're, we're leaving soon. We're, we're going back, uh, repack. We, we spend three weeks at home, praise God, at our ministry center in Colorado, the headquarters where DTBM is. And we're gonna be there for three weeks and then we load up and we go uh, out of the country and we'll be back and forth doing summer conferences. And then we go to United Kingdom, I can't wait. We're going to be, Lord willing, speaking at a refugee center where they have uh, new believers from, I think, 17, 19, or 21 different countries around the world. And then we go from there uh, to Italy, where we're going to be teaching the life and letters of uh, Paul, the 13 epistles. Then we go to Greece, and, and everywhere we go, there are refugees, there are new believers, uh, there are training centers for next generation uh, missionaries. Then we go on from there to East Asia, and we're going to round out till Thanksgiving. So, I mean, we're gone September, October, and November, and we're training the next generation that are actually in training centers going back. They're, they're not trying to get educated and go to America and get rich. They're going back to the countries they're coming from. Uh, my last class there, we had someone from mainland China. We had someone from Myanmar. We had someone from India, we had some from Bhutan, we had uh, some from Japan, uh, Canada, of course, Korea, um, uh, in the class, Australia, uh, Singapore, I can't even think of all of them, Malaysia. But you know what these are? They're Asians that want to reach Asia. They're Africans that want to reach Africa. They're Europeans that want to reach Europe. They're South Americans that want to reach South America. And they're North Americans that want to reach their own in North America. But you, look at this, you share your resources. And I want to thank you, every one of you, number one, for praying for us, because we've seen the Lord answer your prayers. Uh, we've had all kinds of difficulty, mechanical difficulty, flight difficulty, COVID difficulty, testing difficulties. Uh, Technical difficulties. Uh, one, one of the places I taught, uh, I was speaking and the lights went out, the computer went off, and, and the sound system went off. And I said, most of you have phones out there. If you have a phone, uh, you know, turn on your flashlight or turn on your screen and shake it so I can see. And all over the auditorium, they said, we can hear you. And I went on and taught the class just with the emergency light shining down on my Bible for the next half hour. And you know what they told me? I, I got so many notes from those students. They said, I will never forget that class. It was just like the first century. We didn't have any electronics. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have sound system. We didn't have computers. And we just had the Word of God. Thanks for sending us. Thanks for upholding us. Thanks for supporting us. And any of you that maybe are new, down in the uh, description of this video, you can see uh, a little link to our, our website, our Discover the Book website, and it shows how you could partner with us. And I would love for some of you to actually invest in a missionary. Everyone should support a missionary that's going out from where they are to the furthest ends of the earth. We're, we're only part of hundreds and hundreds of good, faithful Bible teaching missionaries all over the world. But if you don't know one, we would like to be your first missionary that you personally invest in their ministry. Well, back to the, the sheet. Uh, number five, bringing people to Christ. We're supposed to evangelize, and I have uh, many opportunities to do that, and all of us should be sharing the gospel, sharing gospel tracts. We sacrifice our desires for others, and we pray. Okay, the seventh lesson is God designed me to be his priest. Uh, that speaks of holiness and sacrifice and surrender and, and a life focused. Number eight, 
I mean, look at this. This this is this is another time I would lean across the table. Uh, look what it says in verse eleven. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Abstain, turn away from fleshly lust that war against the soul. And what the Lord wants us to do is He wants us to look at this. Lusts are always trying to gain an opportunity to defeat me. We're sojourners and pilgrim. And then from the MacArthur Study Bible, I wrote, Peter called his readers to a righteous life in a hostile world. Christians are foreigners in a secular society. Our citizenship is in heaven. And there are three perspectives. And, and this is something John MacArthur wrote in his uh, study Bible. Uh, we're pilgrims, we're citizens, and we're servants. And literally, abstain would be better translated, hold yourself away from fleshly lusts. In order to have an impact on the world for God, Christians have to discipline in an inward and private way by avoiding the desires of the fallen nature. And you can look at Galatians 5. And by the way, fleshly lusts include much more than sexual temptations. You understand that? It's pride. It's, it's impatience. It's, it's a lack of tenderheartedness. It's a lack of compassion. All of those are fleshly lusts. Materialism, all those things. Wanting to watch uh, videos and play games and listen to music rather than being in the Word like a newborn babe. Those are all fleshly lusts that we have to push aside. But look at this. They war against the soul. And war, that's a Greek word, stratuantai, means to carry on a military campaign. Fleshly lusts are personified as if they were an army of rebels or guerrillas incessantly searching out and trying to destroy our Christian's joy, our peace, and our usefulness. Say no to sin, and you'll feel the joy of the grace of God through the Spirit of God. And learn to say no by habit, learn to say no by faith, learn to say no with longer and longer times of, of just denying those sins that so easily beset us. Lust is always trying to ambush me. Great study for this week. Uh, number nine, live as ideal citizens. We should be we should be the kind of people our neighbors wish they could be like, not someone they don't like. We're supposed to be winsome, model citizens for God, not militant, but Christ-like. Number 10, expect to suffer persecution. Look what Peter said in verse 18. Uh, be submissive to your masters. Uh, and it says, uh, verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He suffered and didn't threaten. On and on. That's a great section about suffering and God's plan for us. Okay, now this is only the first chapter and I see we're on minute 43, so we're supposed to be done in an hour, so I'm going to go really fast. But let me pray this application prayer. Lord, since you saved me, now I want to abandon anything that displeases you. I love the taste of your grace. I want to grow. So help me by your grace to lay aside all my sinful ways. Build my living stone into helping your church to grow in offering worship to you. I am your priest. I am abstaining from lust, and I am submitting to you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now that, that's actually the prayer I wrote right here in my journal and typed out for you to see after I read this chapter. Okay, chapter 3, My Submissiveness and Suffering. This is my 11th lesson, 10 in chapter 2. Uh, look at verse 1. Peter said this, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Now, if you could see my Bible clearly, you'd see I've circled submit in chapter 2, 13, then again submissive in chapter 2, verse 18, and then um, verse 25, a form of it is in verse 25, and then verse uh, 1, it says, likewise, be submissive. So, what you see there is submission starts way back in chapter 2, and now it's being applied. Look at this. God designed gender-specific roles. The idea of submission is tied back to chapter 2, verses 13 and 18. We are to be following our biblical roles and relationships. God has a gender-specific role for me as a man, and he has a different gender-specific role for any woman and wife and mother. As, as it's different from a man and a husband and a, a father. So there are gender-specific roles. And, and, you know, Ephesians 5, you can go back to that 52 greatest chapter lesson. I went through all of those 
parts of God and, and his design and in 1 Corinthians 11 roles and how there's a role within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the church. Uh, and so then the church is submit to Christ, even so as uh, the men submit to Christ, uh, the women submit to their husbands, all that we've covered, but God has gender specific roles. Remember that, study that, read the footnotes in your study Bible. Uh, God explains true beauty. Look what it says. Be submissive to your own husbands. This is primarily uh, to women that had these pagan husbands or carnal husbands. Even if some do not obey the word, that could be a pagan or a husband that's, that's a Christian, but he's not surrendered, that they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. You know what it says? It says a woman has a unique ability to incredibly influence her husband by not saying a word but by submitting to him and everything except when he tells you to do something that's wrong biblically. But you submit to him as your husband. It doesn't mean you don't talk it over and it doesn't mean that you don't share your ideas, but the final say is him. If without a word you don't resist him and nag and everything, God says that he will do an amazing work in his heart. So, and we cover that in, in uh, Ephesians 5. Now look at God's charge to husbands. This is the big one. Husbands are charged, look at verse seven. Husbands likewise dwell with your wife with understanding, giving honor to your wife as a weaker vessel, as heirs together the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. What he's talking about, there's an incredible power of, of a husband and wife who know the Lord who agree in prayer. But this is why all those wives, remember I told you a while back that at the beginning of this class that all these wives were coming up of the men that were in my Bible study saying, what are you telling my husband to do? He's changing. He looks at me when we talk. He listens to me. He started to write down uh, things he finds out about me. Well, let me read through this. I'll show you some ideas. Husbands are charged with understanding and honoring their wife. We are weak. That's what it says. And they are the weaker. That's comparative degree. I'm weak. Bonnie's weaker. But we're both weak. But I'm weak. She's weaker. It's a comparative degree. But I'm supposed to honor her and understand her. Now, here's a practical tip. Do the Ephesians 5 card with her and start a discovery journal where you discover things about your wife. I have now, because we travel, it's in my notes. I'm always writing down new things I learn about Bonnie. I love to be up you know, with a group of people and listen to her talk and she'll say, oh, to someone, she'll say, oh, I've always wanted to do this or I love or I'll never forget. Always, never, whenever I hear that stuff, it just quickly I get this out and I've learned everything about her, her favorite things that she loves and things she doesn't love and things that she doesn't want to do and does want to do and what she likes to eat and where she likes to go and her favorite scripture and her favorite songs and her favorite colors and all those kind of things. Do you know what that means? God wants us to act like we're still dating our wives. You know what I tell people? I've never stopped dating Bonnie. And, and I hope that the Lord, I've already asked him for a late checkout. I say I want to stay as long as I can on this earth with my wonderful wife. And I've asked him if he allows any chasing in heaven, I want to chase Bonnie because I love her. But you know what the Bible says? He charges us. Uh, what's the Ephesians 5 card? Well, right here is a picture. This is our website, Discover the Book. There's uh, resources as one of the tabs. It says this at the top, free downloadable resources. Here are those 108 verses every Christian should know. Uh, those of you who have asked me all about the Roman Catholic Church, Titus 2, men and women, but here's what I'm talking about right now. That is a little card. It fits in your wallet. It's a credit card sized card that I keep in my wallet. It's the size of a credit card and I stick it into my wallet and I use it with Bonnie. And what it is, is it's the, the goals and desires of a Ephesians 5 husband and the goals and desires of an Ephesians 5 wife. I first tell Bonnie, I repeat to her those affirmations. Um, that I want to, Ephesians 5, love you as the Lord. I want to be uh, leading you like Christ leads. And I want to be subject to Christ. And I want you to follow me as I follow Christ. Now, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, we're at 49 minutes. Um, Bonnie and I were invited by a, a Christian foundation to go to Mexico City. 
and we went and it was the time of our life and it was incredible. It was a church planners conference. There were 250 of them. But you know what they asked us to do? This Ephesians 5 card right there. They said that they're so busy serving the Lord that, that their marriages are strained. So what I had them do through an interpreter is I had the men and women stand with Ephesians 5 and affirm the seven affirmations of an Ephesians 5 husband. You need to get the card and find out what they are. And the seven affirmations of an Ephesians 5 wife. And I had them stand facing each other like this. And so I, I told all 250 in, I said in English, okay, let's all stand. And so the translator said it in Spanish. And he looked at me curiously and I said, now turn and face one another. And he said that to him and he looked at me curiously. And I said, now I want you to, men, I want you to repeat these seven uh, affirmations to your wife. And the translator said to me in English, uh, they won't do it. And I, I said, what? He said, he said, what I already have read what you're going to say. He says, he says, Mexican men do not say that, even Christians, to their wives. Out loud, that I want to love you and serve you and I want to, you know, be your closest and dearest friends. They would never say stuff like that. I said, I said, just translate. And he said, no. And I, I never had a, an argument with my translator. I said, if you don't, I'm going to, because I had it translated in Spanish, I said, I'm going to pass them out and just have them read them. So finally he said, okay, but he said, they won't do it. I started. And the men looked at their wives and they said, I want to love you and serve you with all my heart as Christ loves and serves the church. And that, that was number one. Number two. Number three, they went through them. As I was speaking, the auditorium had can lights, you know, the ones that shoot straight down. I could see all the, the men and women had shadows, but I could see in the women's faces silver lines. It was tears running down their face. At the break, the women mobbed Bonnie, and, uh, and, and Bonnie got to teach them and had, I, I could tell you stories about her, and we just have seen God do so many things, it's hard to, to not tell you all these stories, but she, they mobbed her, and you know what they said to her? One of the women, she said, my husband, we've been married 33 decades, 30 years, has never said anything like that to me, ever, in our marriage. And she said, I don't even care if he doesn't mean it. Hearing him say it, and she just had tears running down her face, she said, what's the greatest thing? Do you know what God wants? God wants everyone, if you're a godly husband, Get that card there, that Ephesians 5 card in the left corner, and print that thing out, put it in your wallet, and take your wife on a date and surprise her and affirm all of them or just one of them and say, by God's grace, I want to do this in our marriage. <laughs> That's why those women were coming to me in the hallway. They said, my husband is acting so different. Okay, number 14, we're called to bless. Um, and there are five quick commands from God here. Uh, to do good, seek peace, pursue peace, be aware of God's ears, eyes, and face. That's verses 10. So that's 14 and 15. And we're supposed to expect suffering. Uh, see what it says in 3.13. Uh, who is he who will harm you if you follow what is good? But if you suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And, and be willing to suffer. Be ready to suffer. Uh, salvation is amazing. Now this, all of this is from the MacArthur Study Bible. And you just need to read this section because it covers what is this about the days of Noah and the, the demons uh, that, that are involved in this horrible perversion and what does it mean saved by water and baptism saves us and what is all this about? Basically, Peter explains that salvation is like the ark and the people in the ark were saved, the people out of the ark were drowned by the water. He said, Baptism doesn't save you any more than the flood water saved the people there. What baptism is, it's the answer of a heart. It's an act of obedience. It doesn't wash away sins. It's an act of obedience. Read uh, that section of the MacArthur Study Bible. So this is my uh, prayer for chapter uh, uh, 3. Lord, I want to line up behind you and every other authority you've placed in my life. Thank you for my godly and beautiful in your sight wife, that Bonnie is beautiful in your sight and mine. Help me to understand Bonnie more and more every day. Help me to be compassionate. Help me to be a blessing as I turn from evil and always turn toward you for Jesus' sake. 
Amen. Uh, chapter 3, now we're on chapter 4. Real quickly, Jesus wants us to wear our helmet. We're supposed to arm ourselves with the mind of Christ. That's in verse 1. There are only two choices on the shelf, uh, choosing to do the flesh. Remember, you've heard me say this, only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God, pleasing self. Pagans cannot understand us. Uh, see what it says in chapter 4. It says in verses 4 through 6, in this regard, they think it's strange you don't run with them. Your old pagan friends, when you get saved, they think you're crazy. They can't understand salvation. Uh, and they, they are into dissipation. And by the way, you can read, this is a great section. This is another quote from the MacArthur Study Bible. Read the note on verse 4, on verse 5, and verse 6. And it, it's wonderful to apply. Get serious about eternity. See what it says in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Be serious and watchful. That's Peter's uh, expression of how to grow in our prayer life. Uh, here, this is great. MacArthur covers, but I'll tell you what. Peter reduces down all spiritual gifts to two, speaking and serving. Now, there are all these spiritual gift lists. You can read about uh, them in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. But the bottom line is God wants us to be speaking for him and serving him. Uh, and, and serving him, some people do more serving than speaking, some people do more speaking than serving, but all of us are supposed to be doing a little of both, okay? That's what Peter says. Now here's the ending. First century believers faced horrible tortures. This is what Peter said, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. This phrase in verse 12 could be re read as the painful trial that burns among you. The original readers would have heard this as martyrdom being burned at the stake. It could describe the fact that followers of Jesus in the city of Rome, the place where Peter may have lived as he wrote this, were being dragged from their families, dipped in tar, and used as living torches. Uh, they were facing horrible tortures. Could have been even dying at the stake. But they experienced, verse 13, divine comfort. Look what Peter says. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. Our suffering is the same kind of thing Christ received, and therefore, in some sense, suffering is an indication that we identify with Christ. The word in verse 12, partake, is taken from uh, the word koinoneo. We share in fellowship. At the end of this verse, we see Peter referring to exceeding joy. Reminded of biblical joy at its deepest sense is a profound confidence that God is in control of every part of our life, even the painful parts. And then look at verse 19. First century believers know that God allows no accidents. Here's what the scriptures say. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Now listen, we're near the end. In this one verse, we can see the content of the entire letter of 1 Peter is summarized. We as believers do not suffer accidentally, nor do we go through affliction because of some irresistible forces of fate. Rather, each time that we suffer, it's always and only according to God's will. That's why we want to daily renew our surrender to God. And I would lean across and I'd say, did you, like me this morning, in the dark, I got up and I stood in that circle and I said, Lord, I am offering myself back to you. I want you to control me and lead me. Remember what we've already studied from the Lord's Prayer? I want to surrender to you. We renew our daily surrender. The word Peter used, commit, literally means entrust yourself for safekeeping. Listen, if our God can oversee countless galaxies, the constant ebb and flow of the tides of the sea, he's certainly able to personally walk me through any trial I'll face in my lifetime. Do you believe that? That's what Peter was begging those early church uh, followers of Christ to believe. And that's what he's still begging us by his spirit to believe. Here's my prayer for chapter 4. By the way, before I pray it, things didn't get better for these early believers after they got a letter from God written down by Peter. Things only got worse for the next 200 years. They were suffering. They lost their freedom. They lost their security on earth. And for some, they lost their lives. Reflect Christ in a darkening, hostile world of suffering. It's coming. All that are godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer. It's coming. I think it's coming sooner than you think to America. Here's my prayer. Lord, give me that armed mind that ceases from sin so that I can do the will of you, my God.
Train me in serious and watchful prayer as I speak for you and serve in your power. And as the end of days come, I trust you as my faithful creator. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, real quickly, two final challenges. Don't, don't do this alone. If you're married, share it with your wife. If you're a child, share it with your peers. If, if you have any friends at work or at school or in your dorm or wherever you are, tell them, I've started a new Bible study and I need someone to share what I've found and, and, and let me share my findings and my, my application prayer. Did you know I've, I've had people on airplanes that I just met ask me, to share what I'm finding. I've had people ask me in Starbucks when they see me underline, they say, what are you doing? Tell me what you found. You need to start a small group. You need to find someone that you will grow together with in Christ and be accountable to and say, I'm in the word every day. Are you in the word every day? Are you, you know, resisting the, the terrorist plot of lust against you uh, that's trying to strut to and tie to get you into its, like we already studied, you need someone. Find someone you can share your findings and application prayer. And number two, pray for us. There's my wonderful wife, Bonnie. Uh, we're coming home for three weeks and then we're going back off. We'll be uh, teaching in Europe. We're going to be in East Asia. We're going to have people in our classes from the Arab world, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from, well, basically from Europe, Africa, and Asia. We're going to be teaching the last quarter this year. Thank you for praying for us. Uh, you can download this card. It's on our website. And, and stick it in your Bible and pray for us. But that's my challenge to you for 1 Peter 2, 3, and 4. Next week, the end of the world. And I'm going to even talk about what I believe possibly could be the reason we don't see America in Bible prophecy. Very sobering. But until then, focus on how to reflect Christ in a darkening, hostile world. And have a great week in 1 Peter 2 and share it with someone. See you back next week, Lord willing. God bless you.